I'm uh, Dustin Hayward. Um, so I'm kind of just going to give a basic overview of stroke. So kind of relax. You know, a lot of a lot of this might be familiar to you. It might be a refresher. Some of it might be new. Um, but we'll kind of just go from the ground up and and talk it over. So um, to begin. Uh, kind of wanted to talk about the impact of stroke. And uh, the way this is particularly relevant to this audience is, you know, we're all kind of going out there into the world, getting ready to do endovascular, um, that type of thing. And everybody wants to go out, kind of do aneurysms, that, uh, uh, coil aneurysms, embolize AVMs. But when you think about the fact that there's 800,000 strokes in the US every year versus 30,000 subarachnoid hemorrhages, um, that kind of gives you an idea of sort of what you might be doing a lot of when you're out um, uh, treating patients. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an important thing to, uh, to treat. There's the fifth leading cause of death in, in the world and the leading preventable cause of disability. So um, briefly, I wanted to go over, and a lot of you may already know this, some may not, but um, just the Joint Commission levels of stroke certification from center to center, sort of the way the stroke is sort of organized in hospitals across America. And um, there are three levels of categorization, um, first starting with uh, acute stroke-ready hospitals. Uh, these hospitals are kind of considered like stroke-capable, basically. So you can go in, you can get your stroke diagnosed via telemedicine uh, uh, often, and uh, they have to have a CT scanner ready so that they can possibly plus minus administer TPA. And then they have a transfer agreement to a hospital with neurosurgical expertise. And this is essentially like a hub-and-spoke model, and this hospital would be the the spoke and a tertiary care center would be the hub. We go up a level to the uh, primary stroke center or PSC. These hospitals uh, are required to have a dedicated stroke unit. Um, they have a higher educational requirement for their ER staff, 80% instead of 67%. They have access to neurosurgery within two hours. And uh, they don't have to have catheter interventions. There doesn't need to be any endovascular care. Um, they send those patients to a, to a comprehensive center if necessary. And uh, this is just a map of Washington State, actually, and the little pegs represent the number of primary, primary stroke centers in, in Washington State. And finally, there's the comprehensive stroke center. And this center has to have 24-7 availability of neurointensive care, 24-7 uh, availability of um, endovascular surgeons that can do catheter interventions, um, they have to have neurosurgeons that can perform clips and coils, and they participate in stroke research and are encouraged to have rehabilitation on site as well. Um, what I listed up here is actually the, all the hospitals that are comprehensive uh, stroke centers in California, which is a state of 40 million people. So you get the idea that these are harder to come by. They're, they're much more rare for a hospital to have all that. So when a stroke patient comes to the door, the first thing you want to remember is just keep your composure. And the guidelines that are formed uh, for stroke care, uh, endovascular and otherwise, are from basically eight randomized uh, clinical trials, which a lot of you are probably familiar with. So the first thing with evaluation, your ABCs, make sure the patient doesn't need to be intubated. Find out when the patient was last known normal, get an NIH stroke scale. Um, interestingly, a blood glucose is the only lab that's required prior to giving TPA. You don't need a CBC, INR, PTT, unless there's suspicion from the patient's history that they might have abnormalities in those labs. Next is imaging, stat non-contrast head CT. Real easy. You get the stat non-contrast head CT, rule out parenchymal hemorrhages, tumors, or already established strokes. You can find hyperdense MCA signs, and you can also assess your Alberta score, which we'll touch on in a minute. And then IV TPA remains the mainstay in stroke therapy. So it was approved in 1995. Um, the guidelines from 2013, uh, the updated guidelines from 13 to 15 still keep in, uh, TPA uh, right where it is. And um, you know it's been shown to improve functional outcome at three to six months. Indication, acute stroke uh, within 4.5 hours. Kind of a summary of the contraindications is if the blood pressure is too high, if it's greater than 185 and you're having to use aggressive blood pressure, blood pressure medication to control it, if there's a CT head with obvious things contraindicating TPA, like a hemorrhage or a tumor, platelets less than 100,000, INR greater than 1.7, PTT greater than 40, or if there's an established stroke and greater than a third of the, uh, of the MCA territory. Um, so basically, you just see hypodensity like in the uh, image there. Either that, or even if the patient has a history 
of cranial surgery, head trauma, or, even, or stroke within three months, internal bleeding within 22 days, or any history whatsoever of intracranial hemorrhage, AVM, brain tumor, or aneurysm. So there's a subpopulation that carries a higher risk, basically, of intracranial hemorrhage if given TPA. So um, within that window of 3.5 to 4 hours, if they're older than 80, they have a history of prior stroke and diabetes, and in an NIH score, stroke score greater than 25, indicating a severe stroke, or they take a PO anticoagulant regardless of their INR. And so now we get on to what the criteria are for catheter interventions. First thing is the uh, modified Rankin score, which you've probably all heard of, seen, maybe memorized. But the modified Rankin score uh, needs to be less than two, just a slight amount of disability. If the patient's severely disabled, then generally speaking, it's not in the patient's best interest to go and take them back for a stroke intervention. NIH score greater than six, so it can't be a trivial deficit that the patient has. They have to actually have a real deficit. On the NIH uh, stroke score, it puts them in the category of moderate stroke. And from then up, you can take them to, to the uh, IR suite for guidelines. The last thing is the aspect score, which is a stroke uh, scale for CT scans that was developed in Alberta. And uh, it's the 10-point scale where basically you just deduct a point for each territory that is swollen and involved in the stroke. Starting with the internal structures, the caudate putamen, internal capsule, insular cortex, and then uh, they divide up the uh, cortical structures uh, into, into six different segments. And if the score is less than six, um, the, it's an indication that the, core, the infarcted core is large enough that A, the patient will have a poor functional outcome after the procedure and your, your risk of reperfusion hemorrhage goes up. So the last thing, uh, and this is actually very important for us who are the interventionalists, is a causative uh, large vessel occlusion. This is where a CT angiogram becomes strongly recommended. And not only does it actually show you where the, uh, the uh, occlusion is, so you kind of know what your target is, but also it gives you a roadmap of the vascular anatomy. So if you're dealing with a bovine arch, type 3 aortic arch, or if there's some sort of uh, carotid disease like a dissection or a plaque, it's good to know that beforehand because then you can pick out your catheters and kind of make a strategy for yourself to get up to that clot and do the stroke intervention effectively and safely. And everybody uh, knows, it, uh, heard by now, time is brain. So um, less time to reperfusion is associated with better outcomes. The longer you wait, the more time that goes by, the, the more chance there is that you're going to cause a hemorrhage with your intervention. So in summary, uh, the pre-stroke MRS, large vessel occlusion on CTA, and then NIH score less, greater than 6, aspect score greater than 6, and treatment time less than 6, which is kind of an easy way to remember it, is 666, which I think is probably just a coincidence, but I don't know what these guys do. Spinal tap, guys. All right. And then what is the goal of our intervention? So the TICI score, which is basically a derivative of the TIMI score, uh, thrombolysis and cerebral infarction, and uh, it basically grades the degree of radiographic reperfusion you get. And you've probably all seen this before. Zero is no perfusion. One is you just get a little bit of perfusion past the clot. 2A is less than 50% of the territory. 2B greater than 50% of the territory. The uh, often not listed 2C, which is complete reperfusion except for slow, slow fill in a couple of the distal vessels. And then 3, which is full perfusion. So the patient is now on the table, and we're going to start our intervention. The technology uh, for stroke intervention has obviously evolved pretty rapidly over the last 10, 12 years, uh, starting with the Mercy Coil Retriever in 2004, the number of aspiration system in 2009, the distal access catheters in 2010, stent retrievers in 2012, and then the uh, slumber and adapt techniques, and we'll go over those right now. So before all this, there were earlier techniques to set the stage for the development of the newer technologies, um, starting with J or C-shaped microwires that used to plow right through a clot, to a gooseneck snare, which is shown at the top, which was used to try to lasso the clot and pull it out. Intracranial balloon catheters uh, performing angioplasties. Partial deployment of a retrievable enterprise stent. So you put the stent out a little bit, and either drag the clot back or try to pull the stent into the catheter. Then ECOS microlysis ultrasonic vibration catheters, which used uh, ultrasonic waves to try to dissolve the clot. First generation, the Mercy coil retriever. So it was the first device cleared for human use in 2004. Uh, balloon glided catheter, you get that in position, 
uh, to reverse the flow and mitigate emboli as best as possible. And then you get a microcatheter up and deploy a corkscrew into the clot and hope that it holds on. The revascular, uh, revascularization rates with this technique were modest, about 50%. And in general, studies showed that it wasn't associated with a better outcome. Also consider first generation with a distal access catheter. Uh, in 2010, the outreach distal access catheter became available. Um, it's a flexible distal shaft and a, uh, with enough proximal shaft strength to get you past the carotid siphon and a buttressed access for the interventional devices so you wouldn't have to go up and access every time with a microcatheter. The penumbra aspiration system in 2009 uh, allowed a large bore uh, aspiration distal access catheter to get around the siphon. And uh, it was originally designed with a separator, kind of like just basically poke at the clot until it macerated away and then hopefully sucked into the catheter. Um, the larger bore allowed for greater suction, um, but it often required a coaxial distal access catheter within uh, uh, the, um, the penumbra within the, in, with, over the microcatheter to, um, to allow you to get around the, carotid, the uh, ophthalmic um, origin, which they call the, the ledge effect. And then the third generation, stent retrievers. So in 2012, um, basically the idea came to basically fuse the micro wire to the stent, um, which is sort of what people have been attempting to do with this half release of the enterprise. Um, Solitaire from Medtronic was the first to be released and then Trevo followed from Stryker. And uh, the removal obviates, obviously obviates the need to leave the stent, so you don't need aspirin or plavix. And uh, the recanalization rate was proven to be superior to Mercy. So getting into the techniques a little bit, the Salumbra technique, um, which is a combination of words, uh, solitaire and penumbra together, uh, uh, is basically just using uh, those two systems together to deploy the solitaire into the clot with your penumbra right next to it, penumbra catheter, and then you get clot purchase and then either pull the whole thing out together or pull the clot into the solitaire. Um, and theoretically, this reduces showering emboli and gives you more traction on the clot. The ADAPT technique, which is a direct aspiration first pass technique, was made possible in advances of catheter technology to allow these large bore catheters to get more distal in the vessel. It eliminates the need for stent retrievers, which actually results in a lot of cost savings for the patient, and that's one of its primary advantages. The initial uh, description of ADAPT was done with a neuron max, uh, a 5 max penumbra, and a velocity microcatheter with a fathom microwire. And obviously, there's been a lot of vari variations on the way that's done, including improving technology. And one of the newer t catheters that's out, actually from Penumbra, is the uh, ACE68, which is now increased from an ACE64 uh, distal inner diameter to a, a 68 with 16 transition zones instead of 14. So it's just a larger bore catheter that you can get distally, use more aspiration force, and uh, makes the ADAPT technique more more effective. So the last thing I wanted to kind of um, talk about is uh, just basilar artery stroke. Um, it's a rare stroke, but very devastating if left untreated. Um, recent paper on basilar artery strokes uh, from France um, found a 92% recanalization rate using current contemporary technology versus older technology. So, we're getting pretty effective intervention rates on basilar artery strokes. Some things that they associated with better outcomes on basilar artery strokes was a low NIHS stroke score, um, a high DWI aspect score, reperfusion in less than eight hours. And interesting, they, they found that strokes that were from cardioembolic origin were easier to treat than strokes that were um, primary of the basilar, um, presumably because the anatomy was easier to get to and also because the clots were more tractable as opposed to a basilar artery clot that may be calcified and had been there a long time. They also found that distally located thrombus was tended, tended to be associated with better patient outcomes. And they found that worse outcomes occurred in patients where there were thalamic strokes, particularly bilaterally. So that's kind of my presentation. Um, this is sort of uh, uh, my shop where, where me and uh, our group are located up in Providence. Uh, that's the Everett Marina. We have boats up there. Um, that's Smoqualmie Falls, which actually isn't too far from here. And then uh, Orcas Island with a orca coming out of the water.